Hello everyone, good evening. Uh, tonight, um, sorry for being a little bit late, but we're going to be having a wonderful conversation on metaphysical painting. I am joined once again uh, with the artful John D. How are you this evening, Mr. D? I'm doing uh, reasonably well. Once again, and, uh, uh, oh. with the <laughs> artful... Kill the, kill the audio there. No, I'm doing reasonably well, and thank you for having me, uh, having me back on for another uh, hopefully insightful conversation about um about art mm, indeed and my that i do see what it meant about the echo now but um now that you've turned it off that should be okay so uh yes yeah, so uh tonight we're going to be talking about metaphysical painting this was an early 20th century uh art movement um around the same because previously we've had i've had you on to talk about italian futurism with the Villiers and um that was another movement around this sort of time as well as other movements such as cubism uh, and surrealism as well and um, this metaphysical painting is a bit more focused because there's only really um, well there's two but a really one painter uh, the main one being a Giorgio de Chirico but it does also feature a little bit of Carlo Caro who was one of the um, painters involved in Italian futurism and he did a couple of paintings which we'll um, have a look at as well uh, so uh, to sort of get into De Chirico himself, so he was um, Italian, but um, well, he was actually his parents were both Italian aristocrats, uh, but he was actually born in Greece, and his mother um, was actually of Greek ancestry, so he had a bit of Greek in him, and he spent a lot of his early life living in Greece, and he actually studied at university in Athens, um, and that very much has a clear influence on his work, because... Um, there's a lot of a classical um, sort of sculpture that turns up in in his work. Um, this one I have up here, the Red Tower, is not so much, but a lot of others. That's a very frequent theme. But other themes are when you look at metaphysical painting, especially De Chirico's work, is there's um, a heavy use of a light and shadow, and um, there's a lot of sort of pastel colours, and um, they're also very brightly coloured, and there's a lot of use of sort of sharp lights and 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 such, and um, a lot. There's also a heavy focus on objects and the environments there's not really any people in um metaphysical painting is there anything you want to add on to that mr d ah uh, not not so much perhaps as we as we go along I, it's, it's certainly um uh it's it's good to talk about you know kind of the origins of this and and uh i, I think it should be mentioned that a lot of these sort of i would say intellectualization around um especially to Kiriko, uh was more the i mean it was in it was it was more carlo cara who uh who, who sort of tried to codify he and de Chirico's work into uh you know into 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 a into a, into a school uh but the, the i believe the name uh metaphysical painting came from um apollinaire the um the poet associated with um with modernism in general, uh, the French poet, and I, I believe he was a was a quite early supporter of the Kirikos work in, um, you know, you know, in, in after nineteen ten, uh, and so uh, he did quite a lot to kind of promote this idea and promote this idea of metaphysical. But you know, a lot again, a lot of the sort of I would say, uh, a, a lot of the, the sort of intellectual content or the sort of interpretive content was external you know it really wasn't a de Chirico. and in fact uh, his you know statements seem to have very i mean his statements about you know how, how metaphysical applies to his work seem seem to sort of have a, 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 a sort of basic misunderstanding of what metaphysical even means so uh, i would say that he was a much more intuitive um um, artists working with these themes rather than a theorist, you know, because we remember with futurism there was so much uh, there was so much kind of theory. It was a it was a movement that began as as a manifesto and as a theory, and then the artists sort of found a style to go with it. And I think with um, with De Chirico it was very much the other way around. Uh, many of the titles of De Chirico's pictures uh, were actually given by Andre Breton and uh, other members of the Surrealist Collective, so, uh, um, so so a very interesting um, relationship and very different from what we know uh, when we we spoke of uh, futurism. Mm, no, certainly, and um, 
I even believe them De Kirico at one point, I think, wrote like a surrealist um kind of poem or or novel, I can't remember, but um yeah, that was something he experimented with, but then he just went back to a meta metaphysical painting. And um so if we so to start with, um this is one of De Kirico's uh, most famous paintings of the Red Tower. Uh so uh, to start with, um, as I've mentioned, one very common element in his work is these very heavy um, shadows and use of shade and um, also the use of light. And um, I also want your opinion on uh, something Mr. D with the light and shadow in this painting, because I, I listened to um, uh, Culture Dads, which is the podcast that Mike from Imperium Press and Dave Martell do. And they were talking about surrealism the other week and they very briefly bring up... Um, De Kirico and metaphysical painting, and they talk about this one. And then Mike said that um, if you actually look at the um, obviously the horizon and how the light is in this painting, it doesn't look quite right because um, the horizon implies that the sun is either rising in that direction or is, or is set, or setting. However, if you look at the statue on the right, the light would imply from the direction of the shadow that the sun's actually like com it's coming from that direction. So, so the two appear to uh, contradict each other. What, what do you think on that? I think that it's a very good point to bring up, and something that people should uh, sh should should you know who 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 have not experienced these works should go into it understanding, which is that the, these are not rational pictures, and that was never the intent for, uh, the, the intent for them. Um, these were, you know, the these are. I mean, again, the whole idea of metaphysical. I mean, the Kiriko wanted to evoke. Uh, a sort of strangeness, a sort of discomfort, a disquiet. In fact, another famous work of his is called The Disquieting Muses. Um, but this this sense of unease. And so part of that um, is the idea of, of sort of rendering the familiar strange. And one of the ways he does that is that he employs a sort of, uh, a kind, almost a kind of early Renaissance pictorial space, you know, with the same sort of depth and the same sort of perspectival, um, you, you know, arrangements that you see here. We, we, we've got the two flanking um, uh, uh, arched, arched buildings on e either side, forming, you know, perspectival lines that that will disappear in, in a vanishing point right in the center of that tower. So we, we have all the kind of elements that, that are used in pictures that w we're used to describing things quote realistically uh but yet of course there's all sorts of dislocations as you say the light the you know the sort of perceived light in the sky would not produce the light that that very harsh very bright light sort of raking in from the the right side so so you're right but of course this was all deployed in a, in, a, in in you know in in a conscious effort to kind of create, uh, as I said, um, um, irrational images, you know, uh, dr or, or dream imagery. Um, in fact, a very early influence on De Chirico's, um uh, understanding and, and creation of this type of pictorial space was was reading an anecdote from Nietzsche, from Friedrich Nietzsche, who I believe wrote about a moment in when he was in Italy late, late in his life, um, where he just one day was in a, in a square. I can't remember where he was. It may have been Turin. Um, I, I can't remember. I should have found the, I should have found the, the writing of Nietzsche, but, uh, uh, and, you know, it describes, you know, again, this sort of autumnal light where the, the sky is very clear and, and everything is very sharply rendered. There are very long shadows. And I think this was quite inspirational, obviously, to De Chirico, who employed, um, who employed this. But again, it gives you a sense of, of kind of unease because, of course, it's, 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 it doesn't look right. You know, it looks right, but it doesn't look right. And, and again, it's very much how we experience dreams. You know, dreams don't really conform to kind of discrete, perspective and space and this is something that you will see all through these uh this this sort of most fertile period of uh, Takiriko's work mm, and thank you for, for that mr d and um 
another thing I want to bring up is with this um, equestrian statue, what I find interesting is with you've talked about the composition where it's um, very much following in the style of the Re Re Renaissance paintings. Uh, to me, it almost feels a bit like you're looking at a stage um, for, in like a theatre. And from the perspective of the statue, even though it's a static object, because of the shadow and because of the motion of the statue, it's almost like he, it's riding into our view, uh, but it's just slightly hidden out with the obstruction of the building. So it adds a sense of um, of mystery, like who is this figure who's riding on into our view? Yes, and you will see that sort of device used a lot. This, this idea of, of kind of uh, figures figures rendered into shadow and and um the the idea of the unseen um you know object or figure or or entity which is just out of view but was is casting its shadow and it, you know of course you, you can also kind of relate even though it wasn't conscious it was certainly a bit early um but but you could sort of relate you know ideas about the self and the shadow i mean there were a lot of sort of um a lot of sort of ideas that, that came out of related to um, philosophy and metaphysics and even Freudian, you know, psychoanalysis and um, the idea of the unconscious and all, all of that was, was all sort of really brewing at the same time that De Carico was painting these pictures. So I, I think it's, it's fair to kind of pull that in, even though I don't know that it was a, a conscious um, influence, you know, um, as I said, De Carico was, was very much a kind of sweet, generous figure who, who just sort of um, a lot of these things were quite sort of intuitively developed, and then of course theorized by other people, especially the surrealist, uh, on whom De Kirchhoff um, uh, was a huge influence upon the surrealist. So, uh, but yes, I mean you know, and of course the, the the fact that this rider, I mean the rider is literally just out of view. Um, there's also a kind of weirdness that comes with a lot of these pictures, and, and it's something that I think is characteristic of Italy. You know, if you've ever been there, you 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 know, everywhere you go, and well, many places you go, you you have all of these sorts of periods of time, sort of pastiched upon one another. I mean, you know, you you're you're, you're looking at buildings from ancient Rome, which are contrasted with you, you know. Um, modern signage or, you know, motor cars, the signs of, you know, industrial progress, uh, monuments from other periods, you know, you'll get a, a palazzo, which is, you know, from, you know, from the, the 14th or the 15th century. And then, of course, there's a 19th century statue or monument within it, you know, so, and, and also you will see, and especially in other pictures, uh, De Chirico pictures that we'll probably look at, I mean, you'll see these strange anomalous things, you know, because at first glance, you almost want to, again, read this as, as you would read a, a kind of a kind of quattrocento, uh, you know, picture from the early Renaissance, you know, so you're, you're sort of lulled by, you know, this castellated tower um uh, and the archways and all that but then of course you've got these strange inclusions with uh, with other things you know railroads and um, locomotive engines and things like that so um again all, all part of this strange dislocation but I, I i also agree with you that there is something very much like a stage there's a, there's a very much a kind of theatrical uh theatrical quality to these and, and also i think that, that partially it's because they they're also quite simple um you know, they're very, I would say they're very economically rendered. You know, it's it's not a, a picture with with great sort of worked detail like like Salvador Dali. You know, the, these are much more kind of, um, much more kind of um, uh, sparse images. So, so they do, I think that weirdly reinforces the kind of st stagey, kind of look look to them um no, no, thank you for that uh, mr d and um one other thing i want to mention obviously this is called the red tower this is another recurring theme jikiriko likes to paint um towers or tall um structures um, in his painting and we'll get a bit more into that uh so now on with the images so uh right hang on right okay so um, I mentioned Carlo Carra. Uh, so this uh, is 
Uh, we're going to go over the sort of couple of paintings that were um, done by him as part of the metaphysical works. This first one is called The Oval of Apparition. And um, you mentioned there, Mr. D, the disquieting muses uh, by Jakiriko. Well, this is similar. Again, you've got these um, static um, sort of mannequin uh, figures. And then you've got this um, sort of building in the background and then this fish on the floor. So again, we're seeing this sort of vibrant colour across the uh, the chest of this uh, muse in the, in the foreground. But um, yes, I sort of noticed that the floor is also quite dark and, and so is the wall at the back. So again, you, you certainly like the Kirikos. You've got this theory of, e of eeriness going on. Is there anything you want to add or...? No, I would say that this, certainly this work and I think a few others uh, 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 of Kara's Cara, work from the beginning of his association with this this style is very derivative of Takirika, quite obviously, you know, uh, in, including the fish and the mannequins and the, the nature of the architecture and all that. I mean, he was very clearly, um, very directly um, sort of, sort of um, playing upon the work and influence of Takirika uh, perhaps a bit too closely for my taste, but um, but yes, and these are certainly elements that we'll see uh, else elsewhere back in uh, back in Mr. Takiriko's work. Mm -hmm. Okay, and next we have okay. This is a different painting, but I made a bit of a derp and accidentally didn't put the uh, correct uh, painting name for this one. Sorry, but um, yes, this is another one uh, in by Kara um, in his sort of metaphysical face. This one's a bit different because um, there's actually people in this one. And um, I will say there's still a bit of eeriness, I think, with the, the sparseness of the landscape. And you've got that um, building in the back just creeping out from behind the, uh, the rock. And um, also the uh, the rigidity of the figures and the, uh, and, and the dog. Um, what do you think, Mr. D? Well, it's, and it's, it's certainly very much uh, evoking an almost kind of midi transitional medieval style of Italian painting. So if you think of um, certainly an, an artist that Cara admired was um, Giotto, um, who was, you know, of course, a, a kind of late, late medieval uh, painter people should be familiar with. And so I know that Giotto was was quite in uh, quite an influence. Um, and he was trying to sort of, again, find a way to pull these influences from earlier italian painting uh into a new new form and and yet you 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 you're right you you do again it's in first glance you could say well, well oh you know this may be you know this may be a you know a kind of 13th century italian uh, 14th century italian picture um but you know there's again there's just too many odd too many odd things it's 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 just too it's too strange a kind of landscape and you know you get this sort of greenery on top of that unnaturally rounded rounded hill um that recalls uh, another artist whom i know that cara admired um, who was called uh, henri russo who was a sort of uh, i i i hesitate to call him a naive artist but that's often what he's associated with a kind of self-taught um proto uh, what they what they used to call outsider art you know uh, and and Rousseau was a favorite of many of kind of 19th century, early 20th century modernists, including Pablo Picasso, who absolutely adored him uh, very, very early on, and and um, many of the kind of post-impressionists as well. So, yeah, there's certain elements in this that kind of, again, throw you out of this historicizing um, interpretation and, 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 and make it a bit strange. Um, And um, I did look up, and sorry, the correct name for this painting is Le Figle de Loth. Hmm. Yes, and uh, I think I've actually skipped past one of his others. Hang on. Yeah, here we go. And this is um, this is actually his first one um, from the metaphysical period. It's called the, the Western Horseman. So again, this is very bright, um, very a um, lot of brickwork and kind of, I guess I think that's supposed to be metal that the figure and the horse are made of because it looks like um, rivets that have um, yeah. fastened them together. And also, I think this is a bit of a throwback to the futurist one because remember, horses came up a lot in um, the, the works of the futurists. So again, you've got, got sort of motion, but then you've also got um, this weird sort of uh, mannequin, again, a mannequin man with um, 
you've got a triangle staple to his head and uh, anything you want to add to this mr yeah Lee? i mean it's, it's also i mean of course it looks like it, it's a draftsman's triangle you know it's got it's got i've got one that looks exactly like that it's made out of plastic though but yeah you get these sort of odd references it almost seems like a natural follow-on to go from futurism to this literal kind of mecha this mecha horse, you know, uh, with a with a kind of robot, uh, android type, you know, riding it. So the ultimate sort of apotheosis of uh, of the idea of the machine and the and and the and the and the press towards the future uh, with this. But but it's all also oddly not dynamic at all. I mean, one of the principles that the futurist espoused was the, was this idea of dynamism, and of course, this is a very static picture. You know, it's almost like the horse refuses to go. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, and of course, my my mannequins. I mean, you know, people are familiar with like store dummies and such. But uh, there are other sorts. I mean, there's a type which is not seen so much anymore, which is a dressmaker's form. Um, it used to be much more common. You, you know, you sort of, uh, and they all ended up in sort of you know antique shops and such. And you know, they're sort of a staple of. Uh, kind of you know retro victoriana but you know these these sort of headless forms that we use to kind of uh by seamstresses to form a dress uh there's another type of mannequin of course which is more of a kind of in inside a reference for artists there's a there there is a kind of archetypal wooden mannequin which has a this sort of bulbous blank head and it's a very simplified human form and it's art articulated and these are often used in art colleges and 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 art you know by artists as a way to sort of um work out the, the, the kind of masses of the of the human bodies they can sort of pose, pose these small mannequins and use them as a source for kind of the the basic um the basic forms of a, of a figure so uh if, if and people may have seen seen these as well but they're i uh, very specifically referenced here i mean this looks looks very much like one of those i mean minus the rivets but uh so it's it's a sort of uh, it's a sort of stand-in human, uh, which you know has its own has its own connotations and implications. Uh, people may people are certainly familiar with the idea of the of the uncanny, uh, which is I believe in German is called unheimlich, um, but uh, you know in this idea of the uncanny valley, you know where there's there's a sort of acceptable there's a there's a curve of, of acceptability of a false human figure where if it's the less human it, it's it looks the more people are comfortable with it and but the closer it gets without ever getting to full realism it makes people more and more uncomfortable and and that is also something i think that the met these metaphysical painters were were kind of trying to evoke with these these sort of uh these sort of inhuman humans um, or, or, or human-like um, uh, figures blurring the line between a kind of still life and a figure study. Mm, well, one comment I'd like to make on that is obviously the, you were talked about the philosophical concept of the metaphysical. Well, the study of metaphysics and philosophy is all about understanding the nature of, um, of space, time and reality. Well, perhaps there's some sort of um, subtext here that uh, in the early 20th century, man was losing his humanity and becoming ever more um, rigid and, and, and mechanized, so to speak. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it's a concern that you see in so many, so many artworks and, 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 and literature, literature as well from this period. I mean, one would think uh, of uh, the film Metropolis, of course, the centerpiece of which is, a, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is an android. Uh, a uh, very early kind of representation of such. So, uh, yeah, yes, this these these sort of I I think discomforts and 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 anxieties were were all too present in so many artists' work. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And now, so that's all of of the Carol works for metaphysical. So back to uh, Kachiriko. Okay, so here's um one of Kachiriko's very early ones, the Enigma of the Hour. So this is at a train station. Uh, again, you've mentioned that D. That's a recurring theme that trains and uh, locomotives and come up a lot and uh so this one again so this one's um even more shadowy and shady than most because we're looking directly at the station while it's um casting this long blanket over the um 
over the um the ground except there's a little bit of light on the left and um again it's one of the few paintings where there's actual people in it but they're kind of in the distance and they're well the the one in the foreground though is in the light they're they're looking away from us so we can't see the see them and then the other two there's one up in the kind of sort of upper level in the top left uh, you can just see and then there's this other figure sort of shrouded in the shadow so again it's this eeriness and, and mystique um to, to it all uh anything you want to add oh uh, yeah yeah you will see these these shadowy figures used a lot i mean especially effective is the one in the upper window where it, it's not quite clear if that's another human or what i mean you're not given quite enough information uh to sort of to sort of read that and that's something that you will see in in many of these pictures is this the unidentified shadow you know often approaching or often often peering from from the distance uh, also the inclusion of of the clock face um is is something we see time and again but but it's of sort of again evokes this idea of a, of this as a liminal space where you know these figures wait what what they're waiting for i mean ostensibly for for a train but uh, you know this idea of, of of time both passing and time frozen um so uh, yeah yeah i think that um and this you know also the symmetrical nature of this picture it's basically it's a mirror image on either side discounting the the figures in the clock hands you know um so that there's something kind of odd about it. it's um it's seeming symmetricality it's not totally symmetrical but you, you know you sort of uh it's sort of hints at that so um yeah yeah qu quite cu curious and and with, with so many of these you know i mean just this palpable sense of of menace you know nothing is happening that they're, they're quite still most of these pictures and yet there's a sense that at any in any moment something terrible could happen you know something could intrude upon this 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 scene and it's not stillness in a kind of tranquil way it's stillness in, a, in an unnerving sense the stillness of of, of 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 death or the stillness of uncertainty um so yeah it's quite quite uh um quite effective and he really you know this early period you know sort of he he really hit the, the nail on the head quite a, quite a few times with with some of these pictures uh Mm, something I would like to say about the clock is um, it's interesting because it's high up. It's almost like it's um, glaring down and oppressing the figures. And um, uh, there's a fig. There's this sort of chap um, called um, Lewis Mumford. Um, he's a um, he's an American writer. He writes a lot about the history of technology. And one of his most famous books is a book called um, Technics and Civilization. And he's talking about how um, Western man is this mechanical man. He's obsessed with um, machines and um and he talks about sort of the history of technology from the uh middle ages all the way up until the modern period and one thing he says that's a characteristic of the mechanical man or the western man is the clock because the clock is the ultimate mechanical object because it dictates and regulates all the um, sort of work in human activity so we literally have it here sort of hanging in the sky as this like oppressive sort of mechanical god so to speak yeah and, and of course I, I think it's 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 you know reinforcing that is this idea that we call what you know what we call this is a clock face you know literally the the the, the face you don't often get a face in the kiriko um and, and and you know and 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 here it is as you say sort of glaring down at, at you and also counting you know you know you're just sort of dividing up the day and counting time and which of course always has an implication of you know as i say time passing and time running out um so well i, I is it I, you can't tell is it uh is it quarter past 11 or is it uh is it five minutes to three uh oh, yeah, yeah i actually tried to work that work out that earlier but i think the long hand is pointing to the 11 so and because of the light i'm assuming it's afternoon rather than yeah. morning so yeah especially odd, odd, odd though odd though <laughs> um, well i'm going also you could go by the light because it's coming from the west so that would indicate the afternoon but perhaps mm. i'm wrong perhaps he's perhaps he is fucking with us with the light again so but uh, let's move on okay here we are with the towers again so the nostalgia of the infinite so mm. uh this tower's a bit different this one's much taller than the the red tower but 
also what I like about this one is that um, it's got again the classical influence of all the, the pillars around the base and um in fact, Mr. D, this tower reminds me of the um, one of the ones of the ancient world, the mausoleum of Halicarnassus. It was this yeah. Um, yeah. massive, good, sh yeah, good shot, yeah. yeah, yeah, massive tomb that's in modern Turkey. Um, yes, but yeah, no, very similar structure though. I think it was a bit wider the the mausoleum, but similar similar features. And um, again, you've got these two tiny figures in the um, the foreground, just who are just black. Like we can't even see any details. They're just it's almost like they're the shadows themselves and in the uh beneath this tower indeed and, and shut you know uh, uh silhouettes you know be you know their their shadows almost sort of drawn like blood running away from the, down the hill and also again this what is it coming in from the right well I mean, we don't know there's a there's a shadow of a, of something a figure an object uh, some sort of entity, you know, uh, that that's sort of casting cast in the scene, but we 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 don't know what it is, and and and, and which of course is, I think, lends the sense of menace, um, and also that you know, of course, that in the foreground, you know, we're the, the the spectator, we're placed in shadow, we we're in the shadow of this uh, familiar um, arch arch structure. You know, glaring towards this uh, this tower, so uh, you know, ri rising up and uh, you, you know, with the uh, with the with the with the banners at the top, and there's just um, there's just something implicitly sort of uh, menacing about all, all the things in this scene. Um, and again, the light, the sky does not really, it doesn't seem to go with the. The brightness and the harshness of that light coming in from the coming in from the right. So yeah, um, it's strangely enough, of course, with 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 quite a number of the surrealists, most famously including Salvador Dali, there is also this very persistent like idea that I mean, many of his pictures are lit in this clear, uh, you know, at, like bereft of atmosphere, this clear, bright kind of preternatural light of day uh you know if you think of many of salvador dali's work they also seem to share this this odd uh this oddly bright lighting with uh with, with so many of uh, the the Kirikos, uh and uh, and others i mean even even like rene magritte uh you know again this this almost stage like s uh sense of of clear bright light um it's it's odd that it's so so persistent in uh in works of of uh, the metaphysical painters and also the surrealists, who, as I said, were heavily influenced by uh, by them. Well, I just think it's um, sort of a artistic consistency, and um, I just want to address a comment in the chat. So, was this the inspiration for the Ico artwork on PlayStation Two? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, so, if you don't know, Mister D, there's this um, Japanese video game from about twenty years ago called Ico. Yeah. I, I know it. Developer... Oh, you do great. Yeah, because. Um, I've never played it personally, but I just know that the uh, the artwork of that game is very sim is based off this painting. Um, but yeah, may have to may have to try it one day if uh, I can get through all these different uh, intellectual projects for the, the channel and whatnot. So. Yeah, yeah. There's a number that I was also say say the Ico with um, was that was that other uh, Shadow of the Colossus, which is another yes uh, another game which which also features a. Not so much towers or anything, but it, it, it's, it's cur a curiously empty landscape, with you know a solitary figure, sort of encountering uh, very various um, Lovecraftian horrors. Um, so yeah, yeah, uh, and certainly the Kiriko's work is m very widely influential. You certainly see echoes of it in many sort of pop cultural things uh, over the years. Well, his work is very stylistic, so I guess it's quite easy to um to take inspiration from. Right, and here we are. So this one's called the Soothsayer's Recompense. So again, um, with this one, you've in the background immersed in shadow. We've got yes, a train station, I think, with the uh, with the clock. But this one's a bit less detailed because it's all shadowy in in the back. Uh, we then have got this uh, reclining classical statue uh, in the foreground. So again, there's that classical influence. And again, you, there's a locomotive just behind that wall. And um, 
what I find most interesting about this D is actually on the right, we've got this archway, which appears to be framing these two palm trees in the uh, in the background there. And I, I just feel like your eye is naturally drawn to that. Uh, what, what do you think? Oh, oh, absolutely. Of course, the uh, the arch is, is, you know, it's giving you a very strong framing device. And of course, your your eye is going to and, and anything that's shaped like that, that's shaped like an arch or a door or a window, uh, you, we just naturally sort of then we're, we're, we're attracted to that and our eyes are sort of drawn into the distance because it's how we look through a window or how we look through a door. You know, it's a uh, this this sense of a portal. So uh, and, and of course, he's he's he's. Uh, you know, he's very deliberately using that, and uh, and of course the clock contrasted with this uh, classical. I would say this this is one of his more overtly classical statues. Uh, often they're often they're more kind of either quasi classical or they're kind of nineteenth century kind of monuments where we we saw with the equestrian uh, the equestrian statue in the earlier picture. So. Uh, uh, but but yes, I mean again the glare of the clock face, um, you, you know, over this scene, which should again is this is this a reclining figure, or is it you know like Lucretia, you know, dying? Um, we, we we don't really know, and it, again it's 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 more unsettling than it is serene. Um, so uh, and yes, of course the ever present locomotive, which shows up in many of these pictures i'm also reminded um this is going to be a very obscure reference but there's a famous postmodern opera that was written by philip glass and robert wilson uh called einstein on the beach uh and it's 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 famously it's a non-narrative uh musical piece and it's very characteristic it's also very long it's usually about five hours long um, and I wonder also, there's, I, now that I'm thinking about it, there's a very clear kind of influence from the Kiriko because there's, there uh, is a multiple appearances of kind of uh, figures dwarfed by very flattened architecture. There's clock faces. There's a lo literal kind of steam belching locomotive that appears several times in the show in different forms. So, uh, uh, it's, it's curious that I, I hadn't sort of connected um, this sort of the Kiriko imagery to uh, to that piece. But if people are, are interested, it's, a, it's another, again, another kind of curious uh, um, artistic um, reference um, to, 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 to these, these, uh, these works, you know. And also, I've just had a thought, Mr. D, talking about the metaphysical and um, surrealist connection, obviously a clock is very prominently um, placed in one of Dali's most famous paintings, the uh, the persistence of memory. Except in that yes. one, it's a it's a it's a melting clock and not it's, a not conventional clock. <laughs> limp, a limp and flaccid clock, yes, rather than a rather than than a kind of authoritative one. So yeah, 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 yeah it's quite 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 curious. And also, you um, we talked about this influence of um, Nietzsche on De Kirico. Something that has also just occurred to me is that with all of this darkness and shade, it make you know you think of that famous Nietzsche quote: "One must not stare into an abyss, or an abyss will gaze into you." And uh, mm. it's almost like with the framing, it's almost like De Kirico saying, "Just just look over at these nice palm trees. Don't stare into the the black um, abyss, abyssal um, train station that the uh, locomotive is going into." <laughs> Yes, in, in, indeed. Uh, uh, some, so, someone in the chat also says uh, inspiration for the vapor wave aesthetic, and I, I can certainly see that as well. Um, I'm not that the, the, I'm not that familiar with vapor wave, so I'm not. I, I yeah, I mean, it was something that, that was certainly uh, you know quite pre prevalent a couple of years ago. It still goes on, but it, you know that it, it, it's sort of like that. Often, like these vastly perspectival empty landscapes with kind of 80s neon neon lights and and like classical statues or kind of roman you know, oh i know what you mean now okay. imperial right. heads you, you know that you know that you've certainly seen it yeah so yeah i i wonder if that's certainly another influence of uh de Chirico was an influence upon that sort of aesthetic uh, that's just giving me flashbacks of the foundations of entrepreneurship and trailer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, yes. That wonderful trailer, though. Right. Okay. And here again, 
this is I think this is actually a lesser known to Kerico one. So this is called the Dream Transformed. And again, um, so this type of classical statue here, it's just the head comes up again later on as well. Um, so it's sort of a head like it's almost like a, a bust um on this um bit of concrete, and then you've got some uh, bananas and pineapples in the foreground, and again in the back you've got a locomotive, and to our right it appears to be another train station. So Mm. Um, and but this time it's obviously from a different perspective, um, considering the stations on our right. And um, yeah, and one thing I will say is, though we've said that um, De Kirico's paintings are quite static, I always find he's able to bring uh, life into things that are supposed to be lifeless. So, like uh, f for me, this statue on the left, it almost just feels like um, he's like a philosopher contemplating. Hmm. Yeah, yes, yeah. so it's very curious. Uh, there's, there's, there's quite a number of these pictures where you, you get these, these, these sort of contrast of deep, of deep sort of distance and deep perspectival space, but the, the foreground of the picture is, is, is sort of dominated by quite small objects. You know, this is again, again, this, this sort of, uh, this sort of cross genre thing of the, of the sort of, it sort of landscape. The architecture and then the still life, uh, you know, and of course the conventional objects of the still life, a statue, fruit, you know, arranged, uh, but of course employed to very different effects. You know, you're not looking at this like a, like you look you look at a wonderful Paul, uh, wonderful um, Cezanne, um, you know, still life of apples and and pears and such, you know. Um, so uh, you know that again. There's almost a menace, and and you see these strange echoes. I mean, it's it's almost as if there's there's a kind of not a narrative, but there's a kind of continuity between these pictures. I mean, you get the of course you get the uh, the railroad station, you get the train, you get the tower, but also if you notice the pineapples, their positioning mirrors the palm trees in the previous uh, picture that we looked at. You know, oh yeah, kind of oh yeah. Like they're, they're kind of standing in for that, and then of course, then you start to think, you know, the the, the 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 pineapple leaves as 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 a kind of you know as as an echo of the of the palms, you know, and again, so much of this is is the sort of illogic of dreams. Um, these bananas also turn up in a number of the Kiriko pictures. I mean, it was a, it was a consistent. Uh, it was a consistent image, and of course, one is very tempted to to, to again to stray into Freudian readings of these pictures. Um, um, although, again, whether that was a deliberate a deliberate sort of reference to uh, you know new newer ideas of you know uh, of uh, psychoanalysis or not, um, I was de Kirchhoff kind of bit frusy or. <laughs> well, no, I don't believe. I don't believe. I mean, he was, uh, by all accounts, he was a he was an odd person, uh, a very a very odd person. But uh, but again, I mean, you know, one uh, the banana. I, I don't know. Anyway, I shan't get into it. But uh... mm -hmm. no, understandably, uh, right. Oh yeah, and, 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 really... and the sort of de the sort of pendulous te testicularity of the the of the of the dual pineapples i mean it, you know i, I don't think it <laughs> okay. i don't think it's that far afield to to, to kind of see this in in, in this image oh, okay i see i see what you're saying so um yeah uh, yeah um you know instead of meat and two veg it's bananas and pineapples now <laughs> yeah, banana, <laughs> banana, bananas and, and, and pineapples yeah yeah you know i uh yeah i i don't i don't, I don't think it's far, too far afield to so that was an interesting, interesting thought. But and speaking of pairs of things, I remember when we had the um, the tower. Obviously, there was the pair of shadowy figures as well. Mm. Okay, uh, this one is a very famous Chikiriko one. So again, this is called the Song of Love. Now, this out of all his paintings is, I think, I find it incredibly cryptic, even more so than most of his others. And I'm struggling to find a meaning in this one, but I still love it. Um, but again, so you've got the classical bust head um, on this wall, and then you've got like a, a rubber glove, and then this ball, and then again, there's the locomotive in the background. And um, again, I feel this this bust, uh, this person, 
I w- again, th- I really feel there's like a lifelike quality. It's almost like they're forlornly looking forward um, off into the sky. Um, what's your thoughts, D? Uh, hang on, I'm, I'm just looking, looking at, so trying to find the image. Uh, it, yeah, so, so I, I, as with the, as with the previous painting, I'm very much tempted to to sort of think about this as a kind of psychosexual Freudian reading. Uh, so there, there were several artists who were very influential on the young de Chirico. One of them was Arnold Birkeland, um, particularly a painting of. Uh, Odi- uh, oh boy, who was it? It was Odysseus. Um, well, I know Bockling because he was the one who did the um, Isle of the Dead because um, Alexander yeah. Adams has talked about that painting in his book um, on romanticism. But um, speaking of psychosexual, I do know that Takiriko was influenced by a certain Otto Weininger. And I know um, AA's talked about Weininger and his influence on Julius Eveler and um, Eveler's view on like sex and, and romance and such. So, Well, well I was that. thinking of an... Oh, hello. Uh, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You ro- ro- roboted. I don't know if it was me or you. Maybe my, my connection. I'm sorry. The, the the Birkeland picture is called Odysseus and Calypso from 1883. And it's the Kunstmuseum Basel. And this picture was a, was a favorite of De Carico, uh as a young artist. And, and it depicts... Um, um, it depicts Odysseus as as a silhouette, as a shadow. If you if you if you if you could you know if people want to look at this picture, it's quite clearly influential. There's another artist called Max Klinger, um, who was uh, who was uh, heavily influential on um, the Kiriko. Klinger, I believe, was uh, Austrian or or German. I can't remember which. But there's he 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 illustrated. Uh, I can't remember what what the purpose of these etchings but he did a series of etchings of various paraphilias uh, which paraphilias which you know uh, people now call fetishes um and i don't know if it was for, it was illustrating a kind of again a, an early text of psychotherapy psychoanalysis this sort of thing um uh but it's called paraphrase on the finding of a glove and it's a very odd etching. Again, this is something people may want to look up. Max Klinger is the artist. Uh, it was from 1881, and it depicts some um, people at, a, at at an outdoor skating park or skating rink. Uh, you, you know, um, and in the foreground, there's a young man with a beard who is reaching down to pick up a single lady's glove uh, that. That has been dropped, you know, on the on the ring. And, and as I said, this was a these was a series of prints illustrating various paraphilias. And of course, this the implication is that the, the glove, you know, the, the sort of used woman's glove became a sort of again a fetish object, uh, or, or, or it could be viewed in that way. Because it, again, it's it's a sort of uh, it's a sort of it, it's an analog of the, of 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 the of the absent woman you know it's again it's a skin that once contained you know the 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 the, the lady's delicate hand but of course now it's limp and flaccid and of course that also has other connotations having to do with male um virility and such so i think that this is a very deliberate paraphrase of klinger because uh the Kiriko quite admired um those those very strange works um so well, th- thank you for that, Dee. And um, while you're talking, though, I actually looked up that um, one by Birkeland of uh, Odysseus and um, Calypso. And, uh, well, I really like it. Um, I like um, the sort of brooding Odysseus sort of staring off, shrouded in, in shadow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, quite, uh, it's, it's quite, quite effective and a, a lesser known one of his pictures. Um, also, of course, that this I'm trying to figure out if this classical face is is the apollo belvedere uh which is a very famous um a, a very famous classical ha- um um figure of uh, apollo uh, that people may know i but i think it is i but i think that this is a representation of uh, of the apollo Bel- belvedere's face but people may correct me if they if they think otherwise uh, i don't know mm. 
Okay, so the next one, uh, we have one called The Evil Genius of the King. And um, so uh, no classical statues here, but we've got um, a sorted, um, weird, um, sort of poly-sided, um, multicolored objects. Um, but again, we've got the we've got like this big sort of red sort of stone wall that's dividing the painting almost in two and uh one side is shrouded in darkness and we've got this um weird sort of cone that's sort of sheltering in the darkness and um uh, what do you make of this painting d yeah a, a very odd one it's you know because again it were tended to think of it as a still life but what what are those things you know that it's it sort of defy i mean it all it also seems to have the, the, it doesn't have the we see the spatial logic that is is still intact in some of the earlier pictures it it, it doesn't make sense in this one you know um what, what is the what why what is this this steeply sloping foreground what is its relationship to that sort of um to, to sort of building in 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 the background uh and I, as i said uh the character always employed the kind of appearance of perspectival forms but but they're always wrong you know they're always off uh mm, one way of reading it is obviously it's called the evil genius of a king i don't know maybe these objects are the king's subjects and they're having to grovel and uh, crawl up the steep incline in order to uh to meet the king in his court or, or i don't know maybe that's a, a bit too elaborate yeah i mean who, who it's difficult to tell but you know very again very much like dreams uh we're tempted to sort of you know to, to find rational interpretations even though i think these pictures defy uh in a sense defy any sort of interpretation at all mm. or oh, perhaps it's whatever you want it to be yeah i mean i see i i have the ten i i i don't have the tendency to sort of find narratives perhaps because i'm i'm a at, at heart i'm a sort of um i tend to look at things as an abstractionist you know uh as as kind of pure forms or as with, with their own internal logic and so i've never been tempted to sort of like figure out what it what pictures mean i know that that's not many people look for a narrative in pictures but i i, I so i'm curiously uh for, for many of these pictures i've just just sort of accepted it you know it's just it's it's very much you know we've had all had the experience of dreaming and then in the dream you're aware that things are wrong, things are not working as they should or whatever, but in the logic of the dream, you just accept it. It's just like, oh, that's just how it is. You know, the, 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 my, you know, my stairs are made of glass, but, but that's just, that's, I know it's odd, but it's not odd. I'm, I'm just going go, in the dream. I'm just going to accept it. And I'm going to, you know, climb, climb the stairs. No, that's an interesting perspective. And um, it also makes me think of, um, because obviously another sort of artist, not really artistic, but more a uh, a literary movement um, was you had absurdism with people like uh, Camus and um, even um, uh, Franz Kafka as well. There's element absurdism that the world is absurd and you have to just try and not go insane in this crazy world. And I kind of feel there's a bit of that in this as well. Like it doesn't make sense and you just kind of have to accept it despite how, how absurd it is. I I think that's a certainly a, that's a good way of dis of describing it because I think of course at the heart of things we impose we impose a sort of psychic order on on life on the world on nature on time on space we impose our own sort of sense of of kind of reason and order and, and of course I think that that is a device that which we, you know we use to navigate the essentially unknowable nature of the world. I mean, you know, again, we, we cannot comprehend, if you if you look from a religious perspective, we cannot comprehend the kind of ways and and uh, and logic of the creator. You know, uh, but but we but but in order to sort of function, in order not to be swallowed by the kind of greatness of the world and the largeness of the universe and the vastness of space you know we 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 impose an order almost almost in a way to kind of give ourselves a frame to keep ourselves from going mad and so i i do think that a lot of surrealist and one of the things that the surrealists and also that the kiriko 
was trying to get at is is this sense of defeating or defying people's tendency to, to to want to find reason or rationality or order in these images you know you just you, you just can't it doesn't make any sense and there, there's nothing in this picture that's going to really give you any foothold you know i mean literally you if you try if you try to walk up there you 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 probably end up sliding back down again um you know quite violently as you hit those weird things on your way down so uh, so yeah this is very much I, I think part of the project is 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 the idea that these are you know to depict things that are um, that are quote meaningless or that are at least their meaning is not available to a mere mortal mind you know uh, so, mm, something to perhaps, something to think about mm, yeah, perhaps to, you know there's this idea that the world is chaotic and you have to be the law you have to uh, you know steal yourself and ride the tiger Yes, and 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 I'm I'm also reminded as is that I know that Kiriko read uh, Schopenhauer um, fairly early in his 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 life um, when he he began to receive um, an arts uh, an artistic education after his fa uh, father died. I believe that his that he and his brother were moved and and sort of encouraged in their own uh, directions. Uh, Giorgio de Kiriko towards towards art and his brother towards um uh towards uh was he even was he a musician i can't recall um but uh, certainly i'm i'm also reminded of bits of, of schopenhauer famously the ending of the world as will and representation this idea that of course the ultimate act of the will is to, to is to deny itself and then you know to paraphrase you know then all the all of the va you know the vast universe with its suns and planets and galaxies is nothing you know becomes nothing um and so you know and, and it's almost um it's almost a weird analog of this idea of 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 sort of nirvana you know of sort of uh, defeating the wheel of samsara you know and to arrive at this place of you know of of, of ultimate peace and 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 uh, where everything dissolves away and and so there, there's a weird there's a weird sense of of that sort of thing at least for me in some of these pictures uh, perhaps, mm. perhaps i'm perhaps i'm pushing it a bit too much but uh, but i do wonder i mean no. I, I, I cert, cert, the kiriko certainly read schopenhauer so i i wonder mm. no thank you for that dean i just want to address a couple of comments in the chat so old boy he interprets taint paintings like a David Lynch film. Uh, I'm sadly not that familiar with David Lynch films, so um, I'm not quite sure what he's getting at. So. I absolutely adore David Lynch, and I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that comment. I mean, again, L Lynch is. I would say that there's a that, that there's a touch of the metaphysical and the surreal. <laughs> Uh, that's a, that's a bit of an understatement in all of Lynch's work. I mean, Lynch, you know, famously associated with the television program Twin Peaks, uh, uh, you know, Blue Velvet, Mulholland Drive, Lost Highway, so some wonderful films that employ a lot of these sort of techniques developed by you know by artists during this period, especially the, the, the surrealist artists and, and such. So uh, yeah, yeah, I. Uh, and I, I suspect that uh, Lynch, um, who also weirdly enough designs uh, as a sideline, designs furniture that looks a lot like some of the objects in, the, in this painting. Uh, so I, I suspect there's a there's a bit of the influence there as well. Mm. And um, another comment from Mark Irwin: Only the evil genius king can scale that slope. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Perhaps in yeah. the next uh, from from soft game, Miyazaki's going to put in a, a level called like this, and the, and the boss will be the evil genius king. I, 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 <laughs> it's funny you say that because it does sound like a Dark Souls boss, doesn't it? You know, mm. I'm, I'm like just thinking sense of uh, two Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sense, sense. What, what was it? Was it the uh, eternal seepage, or I, I can't remember. You know, the the, the the rotted great word, uh, you know, the the the, the, uh, the painted world of of Arianist, Ar Ar Arianist, and uh, mm. I just can't beat that with an arch wizard, to be honest. Oh yes, if Morcar was to attempt it, then yes, he would struggle. <laughs> no, Morcar's not going to get up there. Okay, and uh, so this next one is called um, called Fear, and um, 
yeah, I really this one I I quite like because um so you've got again the mannequin, but this one's um sort of a bit more colourful and um it's kind of sort of sat there and, and again like that bust from the one before with the uh, bananas and pineapples. This one is very much contemplating and um, especially with the eye, it's sort of staring off into into space and obviously what is a seer? A seer is a figure in mythology who can have prophetic visions of the future. Uh, so, um, so you know, perhaps there is deep esoteric knowledge within this um, within, within this mannequin. Uh, what do you think, Dee? Yeah, 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 certainly. You know, and it, of course, it's, it's it's weird because we're given the sort of impression of almost the kind of you know the kind of medieval uh, crimson breeches that the, that the mannequin is wearing in the and the, the sort of cyclops uh uh the, the all-seeing the all-seeing third eye uh, and and this you know this um which seems to be an, an architectural um drawing or pe perspectival study on the on the um on the slate uh so uh yeah yes yeah, so, and 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 sort of also alludes again as in an almost self-referential way to the kind of the inner workings of the, of the artist, you know, this is very much seems like a sort of, uh, a sort of schematic of a painter at work, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, another thought that's occurred to me, because um, you can almost think like this is like a workshop and the figure should be studying what's on the chalkboard, but, but no, they, all their knowledge comes from staring off into space and uh, daydreaming in this trance-like state. So perhaps this, or the commentary is that true knowledge comes from um, from spirituality or, um, or or the metaphysical, and not from the physical world, mm. and, and not through re and, and not through reason. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, uh, so th this next one is a bit of an. I've, quite unusual, I think, compared to a lot of other Jujiricos, because this one is quite cluttered, um, as there's a lot of um, a lot of objects in the foreground. And um, again, it's called the Melancho Melancholy of Departure. And so if you look, you've kind of got this um, map with some trails on it, so perhaps a journey. Because uh, actually, if you look, there's some sort of window. So I wonder if... Because um, obviously where he features trains a lot, I wonder if this is like the cargo on like a train or something, perhaps, and... Um, that's like a, a signal flag, which we can see through the through this um, this sort of window. Um, I suspect. What do you think, Dee? Yeah, I cer certainly am struck by the the signal flag. I I, uh, I don't know if it's. Uh, I'm assume I'm again assuming that it's some sort of railroad uh, sig signal flag, but I, I could I could could be mis misattributing it to course, and also this construction. Again, it's it's a bunch of things that defy sort of identification. You know, these these aren't objects really. This is a this is sort of an accumulation of impossible forms. You know that we're we're we're, uh, we're not sort of privy to the kind of for, the kind of function or purpose of any of any of these these things. Although they all seem to be objects of manufacture. You know, again, we we see the sort of rivets or you know the kind of screw holes or nail holes or whatever there's this sense of of kind of constructed objects but again they don't add up to a sort of noble piece of architecture or a sort of structure or a sort of useful object um and you know as for the map i mean there, there's again a strange mixture of both deep space but also a map which is of course a totally different perspective on looking at the world you know instead of looking into space and looking into the distance like you do in a perspectival painting you know you're looking at this kind of piece of topography seen from above so um it's it's quite curious i mean this one also because of the kind of shape and flatness of that map reminds me of certain paintings much later paintings uh by rene magritte um would sort of employ both three-dimensional objects and, and and representations flatness and 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 three-dimensionality in this way but uh uh it's, it's it's an odd one this is an odd one no and um another point is um if you look at the map and you see the trails um i'm wondering if that's like the the route of like the train 
which is even more weird because the blue I would suspect is water. So what is this like an underwater train that uh, all the stuff is on? I mean, who knows? Or they could be they could be maritime trade trade routes. I, I you know I don't know. I'm um, also the title of this strikes me is that a, a persistent uh, see a, a persistent thing object that we see in many of these pictures is the sort of railway station, uh, which. You know, I do think that embedded in, uh, even though, of course, it's, you know, I, I'm thinking of sort of old, <laughs> old locomotive things. But I think embedded in the idea of of, of a sort of train station, it, there there was a sort of implicit sadness because, I mean, both both the sort of anticipation, if you're the one leaving, but also a sort of sadness, of course, of of departing, you know, it's 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 a it's a, it's, a, it's a structure. It's a building made for transition, you know, for, for to to take people away or to bring people back, you know, to a to a particular place. So there is a, there is an odd inbuilt, I think, melancholy in the idea of of of, of train trains and train stations, you know, and of course another, you know, the end of a line. Uh, the building is called a terminal, which you know also I think again has its own implications having to do with with the end of the line with death, you know. Um, so uh, so so certainly a curious thing that he's evoking with this this constant sense of leaving in these pictures. Mm, no, certainly it's um, just another another way of conducting eeriness, I suppose. Sorry, uh, I, I didn't catch you there. Uh, just another way of of him instilling eeriness um, in yeah. this painting. Yeah, yeah, e e eeriness and a, a sense of unease, a sense of discomfort. Um, and they're very lonely. These pictures, also. I mean, something something like we 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 don't need to point out is that again, if these solitary figures, sort of fixed in in the spotlight, you know, in in a way, in these empty piazzas and. Uh, you know, there is something very, very desolate and, and lonely about all of these scenes as well. So, mm. perhaps he's a there's like a subtext on uh, atomization in the modern world there. Yeah, perhaps. Okay, uh, so this one's called Great Metaphysical Interior, and. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot of these um, sort of paintings in what some sort of uh, enclosed room, and a lot again a lot of strange perspective because uh, this one on the right is um, at a bit of a strange uh, angle, uh, and then this one on the left we've got like some sort of country house or, or mansion. Um, uh, this overall, I'd say this painting's a, a bit cluttered. I, I would say a bit like the previous one. So I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps that's deliberate. What would you think, Dee? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's difficult. I, I, you know, yeah. I mean, again, we we have this sort of wrong, this sort of this sort of uh, sort of sense of perspective, but it's all wrong. I, I, and I, again, also using a flat, you know, using this this sort of obvious, uh, this obvious sort of painting of a scene within a painting, um, and the, these sort of various things, which which become framing elements. I mean, weirdly enough, I believe that those are two like loaves of bread hanging up on that blue board at the top. It looks like two ciabatta loaves. Hmm. Oh, um, and also we're coming back to the uh, the twin pairings again, aren't we? The, uh, yeah, the twin ciabatta. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the 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 dual the dual uh, food stuff. Um, so. Uh, yeah, another another one of these these odd ones. I don't find I don't find these pictures quite as striking, but they're certainly. I, what, what's what's fascinating is that De Chirico, of course, and and when he was beginning to to to, to, to paint, of course, it was at the height of of cubism, the height of well, at least the analytical period of cubism. I mean, that was all the rage uh, of 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 the art world at the time, and and spreading all across Europe, and by all. By all appearances, De Chirico was not interested in Cubism at all. You know, he was not interested in, in most modern art. Uh, you know, he had, he had a curiously esoteric sort of uh, 
set of influences. We said Berklin and and um, Max Klinger and, and and various artists like that. But you know, he seemed to care not at all about Cubism. But in a weird way, these pictures are almost kind of pastiches, or almost kind of parodies of the dislocation of a Cubist picture picture plane. You know, if people can sort of picture a people can sort of conjure an image of a cubist painting in their mind you know you sort of, sort of see what i mean he but he's doing it literally you know again instead of the the kind of abstract breaking up of 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 the picture plane he's literally built this weird contraption made up of frames framed pictures and and fra and the and the backs of a canvas and framed bread and and these things and of course putting it in this wonky perspective it almost becomes its own own kind of uh as i said almost mocking um idea uh cubist ideas which which of course after the metaphysical period i mean the Kiriko renounced modern art altogether um for, for a very long time so uh so so i i'm tempted a bit to sort of view these constructions as as kind of his own take on uh, on cubism rendering it sort of literal rendering it in the real world rather than you know an abstraction on a picture plane um well one comment i want to make is then perhaps he's sort of saying you know so you cubist you think you can shape everything in all these odd weird shapes well what next you're going to start having art galleries like this painting like we'll have all of these pictures sort of just freestanding on these like weird uh, wooden straps and then at odd weird angles perhaps that but perhaps that's one reading of it possibly yeah and um old boy again in the chat perhaps he's coming to terms with his father's engineering work on the railroad that's actually quite a good point maybe there is a that that, that element to it Yes, I mean there was literally a biographical sort of uh, connection to the. I mean, his father was a was he was he a railroad was he an engineer or a railroad architect? I can't I can't remember. Well, an and also died been... died when the Kiriko was quite young. I think he was about six years old when his father died. So, oh, quite tragic. Um, mm. So that may be again a sort of psychoanalytic uh, explanation for the the constant prevalence of, of, of trains and railroads and departures uh, in, in so many of these pictures. Mm. The loss of the father, you know, mm. um, the, you know, the, and of course the shattering of, of a kind of masculine role model, you know, uh, you, you know, the, the broken father rendered to a pile of bananas and a couple of pineapples, you know, the sense of the, you know, of the kind of, the kind of masculine essence being being broken and destroyed or, or be or rendered you know uh, sort of devitalized in a way so yeah i've never 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 thought to kind of read any sort of biography into because uh, i i tend not to like to do that i i think it's um it's a it's a dangerous thing to sort of try to explain away the mystery of the artistic process but uh, i i think it's certainly a, it's certainly a good question Mm, and also, we don't want to psychoanalyze too much because, um, yeah, because we want. To yeah, be always, always a terrible idea when 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 looking at art. But I will say though, um, the, the the idea that um, you know the the trains haunt De Chirico's paintings, like George Dyer um, haunts later Francis Bacon paintings. Mm, yes. Okay, and uh, here we go. It's, this one, the grand metaphysician. So again, I think a return to a sort of again a bit of a confusing um, collection of objects. But this one, I think, is a bit more of a callback to the towers of before. Though this one's a bit more unorthodox. We've got the head. So it's some sort of mannequin that is arranged in this tower-like structure of all these other um, boxes and bits of wood. And again, he's a, a gone for this grand open and um, piazza, as you've mentioned, Mr. D. So this grand it Italian sort of public square. And again, we've got like the um, the train station shrouded in darkness on the left, and you've got the eerie light in the sky. Is there anything else you want to add? No, no. Again, a sort of a uh, sort of remixing of these elements. We we see these figures, uh, the, the the you know the, the the this this disquieting muses, the grand metaphysician. We almost get these kind of characters, but of course, I don't know. In a way, I mean, in a way, they're they're kind of they're 
they're kind of a mirage you know it's it's almost as if you know you you in the in some of the earlier pictures you see that silhouetted figure in the in the distance casting a shadow and so you walk up and discover that it's not a person at all it's just a bunch of junk arranged to look like a look like a human to look like a body um and and of course this to me brings up the the idea of the uncanny again you know i mean this is a this is a human this is a humanoid shape you know bereft of life without without anything you know it's it's uh it's 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 the sort of it's the sort of imago of a of, of a human being um sort of drained drained of its uh drained of its life in a way so so yeah there, yeah, there is something quite quite sort of almost like a kind of revelation in a in a sort of horror film you know that moment where you you know you, you pull the curtain aside and there's a you know a skeleton or something there so yeah i mean there is again some, something quite quite odd quite odd about about his sort of stand-ins for human figures perhaps this uh figures had you reek a moment oh i'm not really human i'm just this mannequin hoisted in this uh collection of boxes in the piazza <laughs> Uh, here we go. Uh, so again, now this one is very similar to the um, the other tower we looked at much earlier. You can see a lot of the same elements. You've got the tower with the pillars, again, a bit like the, the mausoleum. You've got the twin uh, shrouded shadowy figures in the foreground. And again, we've got this sort of arch building on, on the right and the eerie lighting. The only thing I'll say is that the background behind the tower is different. It looks a bit more um, of a sort of an arid... Um, kind of surrounding whereas in the other one i think it was um a bit more green yeah it's a bit a bit more apocalyptic i i think this picture uh i think this picture is where you start to see some of the problems with later de kiriko i don't know if you if you have any of that if we're going to mention it but so what happened is that de kiriko he sort of all of his brilliant influential work was done in a fairly short period between about 1910 and 1920. And then, you know, there was a kind of moment where he officially sort of renounced um, modernism. I believe he, he wrote an essay about the sort of return to craft or the return to craftsmanship. But then I, I think, I believe starting in the 1940s, he went back and started making copies of many of his famous works from the metaphysical period. And they're, they're all slightly different. I mean, they're slight variations, but they're essentially copies of, of earlier works. And it greatly harmed his career because of, because of course, you know, he lived into the, into the uh, late 1960s. Like, I can't, I can't remember what, what year, uh, he died. Let me see. I, I've got I think it was 68, I think, off the top of my No, he died. Uh, he is even worse. He died in my lifetime. He died in 1978, uh, which which is, again, that's a long time uh, for, for him to live. And so what happened, is, of course, is he, he spent many decades making copies of his work. And that is very dangerous to do in terms of your market and your intellectual stature in the art world because of course it starts to devalue work his late the later the kiriko copies even though they're works by him they have far less market value because again he essentially just began kind of cannibalizing himself and and with this work it's just like i i mean i see that it's a sort of variation on on that that uh, wonderful earlier picture but i don't see anything that, that, that I'm I'm not given anything that isn't wonderfully implied in the original. You know that it's it's just it's almost just as if there's a slight color variation or a slight shift in in uh, in sort of position. But uh, so I'm not terribly fond of, of 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 some of these works because you know I again I just I think it dilutes the genius original pictures. Um, mm. Yeah, no, we've only got a couple left, but they're both um, relatively unique ones of his later period. And uh, yeah, you're, you're right. I think the problem with um, any kind of creator is, you know, as you get on, do you innovate and come up with new things um, or do you just, um, you know, create sim simulacra 
And I guess it's a double-edged sword because if you make something new, there's always a risk that people aren't going to like it or it's going to be too experimental. But so there is a safety blanket in just remaking what you've already done. But then again, it just kind of stagnates because you're just making the same stuff over and over again. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, he, he he is a person... I mean, it happens. And the thing is, even if you if an, if an if, if one is an artist and you paint one masterpiece in your entire life and you're never able to do it again. And that's more than that's more than most people are ever able to manage. So, I mean, De Carico, of course, had a brilliant period. And, and even if he struggled for the rest of his very long life, he lived to age 90, uh, it's almost like, okay, that's fine. You know, I mean, I understand why he sort of, he was, he was, he was in a way sort of lost later on, but, but that's okay. I mean, I, I think on the strength of these, all of these wonderful works from, from that, that 10 year, approximate 10 year period. I mean, you know, it, it, it just makes up for it. I mean, he did some absolutely dreadful pictures, uh, which, which people can look up on their own. These, these sort of like awful kind of faux, uh, picturesque Italian, scenes with horses and and human figures and, and such you know they just didn't work at all and I, and I think of course at a certain point he said well you know this isn't sustaining me I'm going to go back to the work that really was 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 my best and I'm just going to to repaint that you know so I, I don't know I'm, I'm, I'm offering an apologia for I think you know a wonderful artist who who just took a wrong turn and never was able to find his way home again. He, he got on that train and yeah, and he was never able to come back to the home station. So. Well, that's a, a wonderful metaphor of the artistic career of George George Chirac and Mr. D. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Okay. And here, here we come to the one you mentioned, the disquieting muses. So that, again, this is 1947, uh, but yes, yeah, so we've got these uh, sort of, pseudo classicals especially on the left statues like you've got the pillar and then you've got the the torso but it's um interesting because it if you look at the back it's looking like the figure's looking away from you but it's not it hasn't even got a conventional head it's just got this um, red bulbous shape and then this other one to me um actually looks more like it's got its head and like its arms and it's like in like a fetal position and um then you've got this other statue off to the right which is um Shrouded in darkness, but it appears to be quite featureless. And um, you've got this, and interesting because we talk about the um, the twin objects in the distance. You've got these two like twin looks like industri industrial chimneys, I think, in the back left. And then we've got this uh, red fortress in the the back right. Uh, anything you want to add on this, Mister D? Um, no, I quite like this picture, but <laughs> you you have chosen one of the replicas of the disquieting muses the original picture i believe was painted in about 1917 um oh, so, and... sorry i couldn't oh really because i was looking i could not find um it... an original like all like i found was this version yeah and, and then there are many versions i mean he painted this picture into the 1960s he painted copies of this picture uh many many different times so i mean there is something kind of there is something kind of uh, uh, in, in itself is that a statement, you know, the, the kind of the, the, rep, the, the re replication of one's own work. Well, so and, and there's an anecdote I wanted to to um, to bring in, of course, is that in a way. His what what happened to him in the 1940s uh, well into the 1960s and 70s when he started again to start to just make reproductions of his own work is that in a way it was it, some of there were certain artists coming up at the time including of course a man that i i'm quite fond of andy warhol who viewed the kiriko as a kind of prototype like he was all uh, he was almost a kind of weird, like a prototype Warhol, who was known for, again, replication, almost mechanical replica replication of the same image. It, and, and in fact, in the 1980s, Warhol made a series of prints of the disquieting muses, except in like 
very garish colors. I mean, Warhol ha uh, did these did these print and painting uh, sets in the 1980s, which were literally reproductions of other artists' work. And of course, one of them he chose was De Chirico. And in fact, he met uh, De Chirico in the 1960s. He made a he made one of his uh, one of his screen test films of an elderly De Chirico. So they they he he sort of met him. But it's 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 I, I would say that it's an interesting thought experiment to, to kind of consider. De Chirico, sort of late period De Chirico is almost a kind of postmodern reinvention of himself as a kind of proto pop artist, you know. Um, well, I, I, well don't, actually, I don't buy that. I don't. I don't accept it. But it's an interesting thought experiment. Well, I won't lie. I actually kind of see some of the elements of De Chirico's work in Warhol. Though I'm not that familiar with Warhol. Obviously, pop art and Warhol is very colourful and stylistic, and. Um, I actually, you do see that in, in Takiriko. There is these, there is bright color on occasion, like the the evil genius of a king, and and this one, and also it is quite stylized in a way. So you know, I, I kind of see it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sort of, you know, so, sort of. And and people, if if people are interested, if you just look, if you just if you just Google Warhol disquieting muses you will you will see the the kind of warhol variations of of, of these pictures so I, I mean there is something sort of interesting in the idea that we can't find the original you know and, and in fact i'm looking i'm looking for a print of the i'm looking for a an image of the original 1917 painting and i also at the moment i can't tell if i actually looked I would be able to figure out which one is the original one but it, it, it's a, it's a it's a quite a curious quandary uh let me see if I've got it. No, no, I'm looking at the, um, the Warhol version now, and wow, that actually, I, I really like that actually. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, know. Cool. I, I quite, I quite like those as well. And, and Warhol, he did other artists. He did Botticelli. He did Picasso. I mean, reproductions of their work in that in that period. So, um, so apparently, the original version of the Disquieting Muses is in. The Gianni Mattioli Foundation in Milan, which I've not heard of. Um, this is a slightly older book, though, so it may have moved. But uh, so, if people want to track it down, I mean, it's uh, it's difficult. But I do, I do think that as a freshness to the original versions of many of these pictures, and and you will notice that the later copies, again, they, I mean, as I said, much of the Kirikos work, his, certainly his early work. It's very economically painted. You know, they, they were painted very quickly. There's very little kind of fine detail. Um, they're very loose. There's very loose brushwork. Very, a lot of the things that are, are clearly painted freehand. There's not a lot of kind of premeditation to the actual making of the picture. And I think that there's something kind of nice about that, which, again, once you sort of start to kind of copy an image you've already made you lose that you lose that immediacy and so i, I do think it's sometimes you you can tell which ones are, are the are the sort of original so to speak because uh, because they have a sort of freshness uh to their handling that is is lacking in the copies um anyway mm, well, no, thank you and uh now we move on to the final image uh, in this collection of paintings, which is a uh, Piazza d'Italia in 1952. And um, yeah, so again, you've got a, a, a re another red tower, though this one's a bit more slender than the one we looked at at the beginning of the stream. And um, on this one, it honestly feels like he every single de Chirico trope he's decided to pull into this one. So we've got the red tower, we've got the pair of shadowy figures, we've got the reclining classical statue, We've got this sort of plaza with two flanked by two buildings, and we've got the locomotive steam train. So I don't, I don't know with this one. I feel like he just kind of got like a checklist and was like ticking it off as he went. Well, and one often gets that that sense. And of course, um, this all uh, this also is a copy of the original picture, which I think was painted in 1913. Um, so, so again, this is this is sort of one of the later interpretations. I, I will say that the copy, the the, the Kirko's copies of his own work, they're not they're not entirely faithful. There are variations in all of them, um, and, and of course, if you look at the original of this composition, it's very different from this version of it. Um, 
Uh, in a way, I think the original is slightly less effective in this case than uh, than, than this variation. So, uh, but I, I very much like this this composition. Uh, it's 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 always been a, a favorite of mine. Um, uh, yeah. So, is is that the is that the final one? Yeah, this is the the final one. Yeah, and um, one thing as well I noticed is that um, maybe it's to do with the um, the late the later modern art material techniques available. But I like there's a nice um, sort of gradient in the sky, like it's got this yellow, then green, and then blue. Uh, he may have be, he may have had access to slightly better paint, um, uh, of course, because keep in mind, you know, his early works were, you know, were, were painted quite early in the 20th century and then of course very soon after he, he you know he he started his his mature work uh, world war 1 came along and so there may have been a kind of shortage you often see uh paintings made in the the sort of periods of of the two world wars you will see a slight decline in quality in in the color and the, the quality of the pigment because they there were some things that weren't available during the during wartime because of you know because of uh, um, rationing and 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 the use of some of these chemicals to make you know uh, material for for war rather than for artist paint so yeah yeah uh, pa paintings from the 1930s and early 1940s especially uh, European paintings look very lean. Uh, and 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 quite dull. Uh, I think it's 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 possibly due to that as well. So and yeah, by the nineteen fifties, he would have had uh, probably much more vibrant paints. Um, mm, and also with the thirties, it's obviously the aftermath of the Great Depression. So I think there was a lot of um, yeah. economic um, downturn. So yeah, a lot of poverty. So mm. yeah. Um, so I, and I, I should just bring up. I mean, I because I have a lot of favorite. Um, uh, De Chirico pictures, and of course we 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 can't we can't cover them all in such a short time. I would give a couple of recommendations for uh, a, a a couple of paintings we didn't see um, here that that I really like, and uh, one of them is an early picture from 1914 called "The Child's Brain," um, and it is a very eerie picture, and it's one of the few pictures from his his sort of metaphysical period which features a kind of human figure but it's a very disturbing human figure uh and so so that's a very a very interesting picture uh there's another one called um uh the philosopher's conquest uh which features a cannon two artichokes and a clock and 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 the familiar locomotive as well, and and that's a wonderful picture, very much like the 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 sort of still life uh, the still life pictures um, that that we talked about with the bananas and, and such. So um, uh, so so those are those are two pictures, and and the other one is called. Uh, forgive me, I'm. Uh, uh, yeah, that child's brain one's a, a little bit uh, uncanny. It's a very, just, it's a very disturbing picture. Yeah, a very, very, very disturbing picture, uh, and that was a favorite of again of the of the surrealists. Uh, they absolutely, absolutely loved that one. Oh, oh, the um, and the third picture that I that I really liked. It's quite again quite sinister. It's called the agonizing morning, which is the closest view we have of that locomotive. Uh, which which is always in the distance and it's suddenly now menacing us in the foreground um, and and that's a quite a strange uh, picture and, and quite a wonderful one. So uh, so just just some some further some further study if, if people are, are interested um, in 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 some of my favorite works that we haven't um, that we that we weren't able to cover. Well, no, thank you for those recommendations, Mr. D. And I'm sure the the chats will enjoy looking at those up, and um, and so will I. And uh, so, is there any final comments before we are finished for tonight? Um, no, no. I mean, other than to say again, thank you for for having me on. I, I, I you know, Kiriko is is uh, an artist of whom I'm quite fond, and uh, uh, so it's it's always a pleasure to talk about uh, talk about. Talk about such things, especially again a, a, a flawed, 
a, a, a slightly flawed figure, you know, who had uh, a period of absolute sort of creative genius um, and, and then struggled, which is, you know, the, the case of, of for many artists. I mean, all artists, of course, have a moment where they, they they are sort of faced with this dilemma, which you mentioned before, you know, do do I innovate? Do I do I rest upon my laurels? You know, uh, where do I draw my inspiration as a kind of, you know, and I'm in that position myself. I mean, you know, just just because, of course, I'm in, in you know, in 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 middle age, and there does come a moment where you you know you sort of reevaluate the things that sort of motivate you and influence you, and the kind of they change over time. And and one thing about being a younger artist, uh, you know, and of course, if you look at many artists, have a kind of brilliant flowering when they're young in their 20s and of course as you get older and as you progress through your career it's difficult to recapture it's almost like when you're kind of you, you're young and you hit that certain period of maturity in your work and it just ideas flow from 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 out of you they come you know they they come out by inspiration from the unknown from your muses or from god or from whatever and it's just like you, 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 you barely have enough time to catch all of them in buckets and before they drain away. But and then, of course, as you get older, you know, inspiration doesn't come so easily. It's it's not the same as when you're young. So so I think artists do have to kind of figure out how to how do I work now? You know, what what are my concerns now? And I think that, uh, you know, you see this in any great artist's work and, and the Kiriko faced it and. And uh, and everyone faces it, you know, every artist faces it. Um, so it's it's very interesting to kind of consider the full the full sort of career and and to watch how artists um, how artists change and 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 grow and diversify, and even when they make wrong turns. So uh, anyway, so but again, thank you for having me on to ramble. No, oh, it's always a pleasure, Mr. D, and um, it's always great to talk about such a great artists such as uh, De Kiriko. Uh, so thank you everybody for watching. Uh, join me next Saturday night, same time, where I'll be having a uh, ranging mandrel on and I'll be discussing with him the principles of warfare. So if you're in interested, uh, stay tuned for that. But uh, thank you everybody for listening and good night. <laughs>